Just the other day, the Journal of the American Medical Association reported this, that in America, people 18 to 24, of them, one out of four thinks about committing suicide regularly. And in the same age group, 51% talk about feeling regularly hopeless, anxious, over and overwhelmed, and empty. Back in 2015, two Princeton economists doing their economist thing invented something that is now a part of our social vocabulary, which is deaths of despair. They stumbled upon this as they looked at people ages 45 to 54 who were white and working class, and in that group of people, as they were studying them economically, they found that sociologically, they were dying deaths of despair at a high level, drinking themselves to death, overdosing on opioids, obviously, suicide, uh, neglect, and every other way that you could find yourself somehow to check out. And since fentanyl became something that's everywhere, deaths in that age group has exploded at a whole new level, even as it has advanced across all demographics in America. What is happening? It's this. People are feeling a sense of inner emptiness so intense and the futility of not being able to find anything that makes any difference that they are just deciding to not live in the pain of that intense emptiness anymore. So they're just finding, looking for the exit ramp and getting the heck out of here to escape that intense inner emptiness. That's the rough stuff. Here's the good news. Jesus talked about this human phenomenon specifically and pointed us to how it can change, how through him that that inner emptiness can be filled to a feeling inside of life, vibrancy, passion, excitement, vitality, and even joy. And that's what we're going to talk about today. It's all within the context of our sermon series focus, the letter S, which for us opens up salvation experienced as transformation. Now, this inner emptiness that is an epidemic in America today, Jesus understands what causes it. And the first thing that we need to learn is why? Why is it the normal, natural state of human beings to feel like they have a part inside of them that is missing? That's the low level. All the way up to the other side of the extremity, which more and more people are at, which is that they are feeling so intensely empty, so futile that they can feel that emptiness, that they are just choosing to basically sleep themselves somehow away out of this life. Jesus has the diagnosis. Why is this the, listen, normal human way to feel about yourself inside? And if I were going to rank Jesus' teachings as the top 10, I think that I would put this insight as one of his top 10 lessons and truths which you need to know if you want to understand Christianity. This is what Jesus of Nazareth taught about the human condition when it comes to our inner life. He taught this, all people are born physically alive, but spiritually dead. It is our anthropology, our humanness, the way that we are made and how we operate, that we do have uh, a physical body that through our agency, with good health and and ability, we can choose and have a free will that we can move these material bodies away uh, around as we self-will and self-guide ourselves. And we are even capable of developing these bodies, developing our brains, tuning them within them as capacities and skills and abilities, the capacity for pleasure, and and, and all kinds of things. We can do that. We've got that going for us because God gave us this great life and these bodies to live in. Now, we are not just bodies. We are also made in the image of God. We have a spiritual nature. God is a pure spirit being. Therefore, the God who created us created us as physical beings and, of course, as spiritual beings. But what is so true about humanity is that just as with our bodies, we can will ourselves around pretty well, but we cannot do the same thing with our spirits. Our spirits are not animated. 
Our spirits are not under our control. In fact, our spirits don't even have the capacity to do anything positively spiritual. They basically just stay dead the whole time doing nothing. And even when our spirits get activated, the tendency of the human spirit is to pull towards darkness, narcissism, and self-reliance. So we are all born physically alive, but spiritually dead. And we will stay in that condition until Jesus comes and brings us from spiritual death to spiritual life. From the inescapable fate of feeling empty inside to feeling fully alive, vibrant, and powerful on the inside, which Jesus wants to do for each person listening today. And that's the conversation that we bust into in John chapter 3. If you want to take a look, page 1055, it's in your Bibles, in your own Bible, John chapter 3, or it's coming up here on the screen in a moment after I tell you this. It's a conversation between Jesus and a guy named Nicodemus. Here's the backstory of Nicodemus so you can get the full effect of the conversation. Nicodemus is first a member of the Pharisees. It was a denomination of Judaism. At the time of Jesus, there was about 6,000 of them. Nicodemus was one of them. These are the special troops of Judaism. These are the people who are most serious about living it. All the traditions, rules, rituals, and customs, thousands of them, they dedicated their lives to doing all of them. So Nicodemus is one of these types. On top of that, he was also a member of the Sanhedrin. That's why he's going to be called a ruler of the Jews. That was 70 men who were basically the overseers of all of Judaism, what to believe and, above all, what to do. And they monitored the performance of fellow Jews to make sure everybody was keeping the rules. There were some hardcore people within the Sanhedrin who wanted to force people to follow the rules, punish them when they did not, and basically threaten them, kind of the Taliban spirit. Nicodemus was more moderate, a little more gentle, a little more thoughtful, but nevertheless, he was as serious as he could be, first of all, by setting the example of living the way you're supposed to live so they can please God, and he was a part of the power structure that made sure that Judaism was being taken seriously. Into that reality comes this conversation in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 8, and it reads, Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to Jesus, "Uh, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Flesh gives birth to flesh. Spirit gives birth to spirit. So do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born again of the Spirit. Again, there it is. Why are we this way? Why are human beings not able to fill themselves because of what Jesus just said? We are born physically alive, but spiritually dead, okay? That's why our inner spirits are cut off from the life source God, our creator, who in our first parents, Adam and Eve, breathed his ruach, his spirit, the pneuma of God, the wind that is the animation of the divine spiritual life. Humanity was meant for it. In the beginning, humanity had it, but we've drained it all out. How? 
by taking the steering wheel of our lives and saying, God, thanks for giving me a body that I can move around in. Now I'm going to use my body, my intellect, my mind, and my will, and I'm going to control my own lives, and I'm going to go here, and I'm going to do there, and then I'm going to go this. Oh, God, that didn't work out so good, so could you help me out? Thank you. I'm back on track, and I'm controlling my life. And by that, just holding on to the incensed, self-reliant control of our lives, God understands that I guess I'm not wanted or needed around here. I'll just back off and let you do your thing and our soul dies in degrees and then more and then more and then more and then more until we don't even realize how spiritually dead we have become until all of a sudden some crisis comes into your life and you realize inside you've got no inner resources and then you feel the emptiness and now what? Let me tell you something about how this un un unrolls in the scripture a little bit more. Let's keep it on the scripture here more for the second. In this conversation, in most English translations, Nicodemus uses the word can four times. Nicodemus is the epitome of a religious, good, moral guy who is confident that he can do the things that will show God and earn his way into a right relationship with God and, and all kinds of rewards from God. I can do it. I'll try hard and I can do it. Jesus, in the same conversation, uses the two words cannot four times. What does that tell you? It tells you that this is how it is with human beings. Human beings say, I can find fulfillment in my life. I can. Once I get my career back on track, I'll start making the money that I've always wanted to buy, the things that I've always wanted to travel in all the places I've wanted. And when I can do all these things with the money that I have, I can feel fulfilled. I know I can, I can fulfill my life. And Jesus says, no, you cannot. Jesus says, what gain do you ultimately have to go through this world having everything that the world offers and at that same time having a soul that's completely dead to me and then face eternity with no connection to God? What's the point of all that? No, you cannot fulfill yourself. Well, I can, you know, like use my body to feel something, right? I have nerves and senses and I can feel something. I can feel pleasure. So I can pursue pleasure. And I can just loose myself sexually and just do all the things that just feel so good. And that will cause me to feel something on the inside. I can. And God says, no, you cannot. You cannot use the gift of your human life and sexuality in a way that is a absolutely most self-destructive to you and against my will and think that it's going to do anything good for you spiritually. It doesn't work that way. You cannot find fulfillment that through pleasure. Well, I can then just numb the emptiness. And Jesus backs off from that one and says, yes, you can. Yes, you can. But it's not going to do for you what you hope it does for you. Because there's somebody else involved in this whole dynamic of you numbing yourself to death. It's the evil one. This is his playbook. The evil one only comes to what? Kill, steal, and destroy. And that's the path to lead to that destruction. But Jesus says, I have come to give you life on every level, to the max, sustainably, and ultimately eternally. Which one will you choose? The things that you can do or the things that I will do for you. What is this all about? Salvation experiences transformation. Being spiritually born again. Surrendering yourself to Jesus and saying, I'm letting control of my life and I, and I know now that I need you to be completely in control of my life because that's the only way I'm going to experience the love that gives me the life I'm meant to have and feel uh, filled on the inside finally and have the joy of being whole and alive. So that salvation experience is transformation today from the Bible, from Jesus. Now, as promised and already previewed by Kathleen, I'm going to tell you my story. This is going to be a tough one. First of all, 
Have you ever noticed that you can get addicted to feeling really empty inside? You can. Well, at least I did. You see, every time I see someone wearing a mask while they're driving alone in their car, I don't judge them. I get it. You can get addicted to feeling anxious and empty and under siege. In a sense, it's, it's, it's kind of like codependency. You can be just drained of everything in, on, in, on the inside, and people know the things that have happened to you, but they still see you carrying on. They still seeing you doing, showing up for work and working hard and trying to be responsible and taking care of other people, and they know that you've had it tough, and they assume that you're really struggling and probably hurting pretty bad, but they still see you carrying on, and they just go, I want to tell you how brave I think you are. You are so courageous, and I have to say, I know it's tough for you right now, but you just keep going forward, and I really admire you, and you think to yourself, I feel completely dead inside, and I've thought about killing myself, but thanks for telling me how brave I am. I guess I'll just keep going. And this feeling, feeling intensely empty can become an addiction and a codependency, at least it did, for me. About 22 years ago, I was working hard for Jesus because I really love Jesus, and I'm so thankful for the love that he has given me that I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. And the way I do that is to work hard for him. My calling is to be a pastor. 22 years ago, I was doing that. At the same time, my wife and I were raising a family. Now, we're grandparents now. And I had completely forgotten what it was like to be an everyday parent. But now that we have grandkids and we're around them sometimes, I remember everyday parenting, it's a lot. <laughs> so I was working hard for Jesus. We were working hard building the family. And I just assumed that Jesus understood why I didn't have much time to spend time alone with him. I mean, I'm busy. You know, I just figured he'd give me a break. Because I'm working for him, and I'm raising a good family. And so, Jesus, I will pray and get alone with you and get my battery charged. When I have time, obviously I don't have time now, but when I do, I definitely will. But in the meantime, just give me a break, Jesus. Give me a break. Which is how most of us live. And which is so dangerously we get away with it. Maybe for a long time. I did until it all collapsed pretty much overnight. My collapse went like this. My dad had a heart attack and died. I did his funeral. Two months later, my only sibling, my oldest sister, who had been in a car accident and was laying in a coma for months and months and months, she died. I didn't do her funeral. I don't remember much about anything that I did uh, when she died other than taking care of my mom, who now wholly depended on me, her only last living family member of our biological family. So it was a lot to process, a lot to mourn. I didn't do any of that because I just kept working. And then the miracle. My wife got pregnant. Ha! Take that, death. Take that. You kicked us pretty hard recently, but we're making a comeback now, baby. We are bringing a new child into this life, more family, more laughter, more long nights, more diapers, more joy, more, more of the best. Ha! Take that death. We are now on top of you. Then we lost that through, through a miscarriage. Have you ever heard of self-care? I hadn't. Turns out it's also a thing. Prioritizing your own well-being. Do the things that keep you physically strong, intellectually stimulated. Uh, keeping the things that also keep your relationships where they ought to be. And above all, paying real attention to making sure that that inner spiritual tank stays in a place where it is in a good place. And when it's getting low, fill it back up. When it's really low, get a major makeover. That's self-care. I'd never heard of it. When I did hear it, I thought it was indulgence and weakness. What I did instead of self-care was work harder and close down a couple of bars. Well, so I was working hard, and it was that night when we were training the deacons. We got the best deacons around, but we were, they were also awesome. And I brought in a colleague to help me do the training. At the end of the training, we said, you people, you give so much of yourselves. 
let, let us lay hands on you and pray that the Holy Spirit would refill you because you pour yourselves out so much. Let us lay hands on you and pray that the Holy Spirit would fill you back up. That's what we do. That's what you do. And so that's what we did. And the Holy Spirit just touched those beautiful servants. So many cool manifest ways. There was just so much evidence of the Holy Spirit just coming all over them, deep inside of them, and, and just the joy and the peace and the release that they were feeling. It was just like the dream that every pastor dreams about that the Holy Spirit will do in his church for the, for the people you're praying for. It was beautiful. My colleague and I were just watching. We were just sitting back watching all this, you know. Just the Holy Spirit got turned loose and just did all this beautiful stuff in their lives. And it was, we are just enjoying the moment. And of course, you know, being who he is, he looked at me and said, so, so we got a little time. How are you doing? You okay? You, you need anything? Can I pray for you? Now, if you knew me 22 years ago, one more reason to thank God that you didn't. One more thing that after years of psychoanalysis, my kids are getting a little better. <laughs> thank God for Kathy. But if you knew me 22 years ago, you knew what I said, but because you didn't know me 22 years ago, I'll tell you what I said. I said to him, no thanks, I'm fine. I'm good. He goes, oh, I can tell, yeah. Okay. You're not going to make me do anything I don't want to do. I said, okay, cool. I said, well, I just, I want to encourage you then. I just want to say, you know, God's doing great things in the ministry. We just love to see what God's doing around me. And it's so kind, so encouraging, affirming me, doing his best with what he's got to work with. And as he's chatting along, he says something that struck me as being funny. So? I started <laughs> laughing, and I laughed harder, and I laughed louder, and I laughed for one full hour, because I couldn't cry. So I laughed, and the laughter made room for the crying. I had episodes like that several dozen times for the next six months. It was so embarrassing. I mean, it could happen in the middle of church. That was deep Holy Spirit therapy. For me, it was a way that forced me to grieve, to release trauma from my body. It was a brutal but lovingly necessary way of crushing my stubborn, prideful self-reliance. Now I'm not talking to anybody today. And ultimately, it was a way to be still long enough to let the Holy Spirit start the process of recharging my life until I could feel that electric, flowing, vibrant tingles at the end of your fingertips, reality of being alive inside like I feel right now, like I feel pretty much most days. So what's this all about? It's about salvation experience. Remember, salvation in its root word also means what? Deliverance. To be delivered from your bondage and slavery, right? Exodus, Moses, let my people go. To be delivered out of bondage and slavery into freedom, life. All good possibilities. The salvation experienced as transformation, being your emptiness filled and your bondages loosed. That's what it about. it's about. So I'm thinking that maybe today there might be somebody who would be in the strong majority here in America, you, 
You are painfully empty. You may or may not, depending on your personality, I have an addictive one, may be uh, trying to fill or numb that emptiness with things that now you are addicted to. I just want to say I understand. I, I know. And today we'd like to pray for you after the service. And if you are watching today and that describes you and you live out of town, contact us, please. We'll, get, we'll contact you back immediately. We want to help you too. If you are numbing the pain, empty and can't figure out why, addicted or in any kind of bondage, that's what this church is for and that's what Jesus does. Likely that there are dozens of people in that situation listening to me right now, but now even much more the majority of maybe life has leaked the vibrancy of the Spirit right out of you. I understand. I, I've been there. We're going to have communion in a moment, and that's going to help. Taking communion regularly, I think, is why I'm still alive today. It held me in place before the Holy Spirit could really grab me and deal with me. So Holy Spirit's coming in a second. Holy Communion is with it. But if you'd also like to come after the service, the friends would like to just encourage you and help you and lay hands on you, pray for you. Sometimes you just resist sharing it with anybody. I wish you would, but I'm going to give you one more alternative. I call it get alone and give up. Get alone with God and say, I give up. I give up, I give up, I give up. I can't do this. Turns out what I learned is we are not meant to do this on our own. Any of it. But I can, and I know I can, and I've shown, and I've proven. I've got awards, and I get raises in the work, and I've achieved this, and I've achieved that. I'm not going to argue with you. I'm just going to tell you from one very successful man on the outside, the reality of his inner life, which really defines all of me in the end. We cannot do it under our own power. What do you mean, Pastor Todd? What Jesus said, any of it, and you don't have to. Stop trying to row the boat of your life across the ocean against the wind. Raise your sail and catch the wind. Your sail is surrender, Lord. I've done all I know how to do. Now would you just please take it over and fill me up. When you raise that sail of surrender, it catches the wind. And it brings you alive. And now I'd like to pray. Let's pray. Jesus, please now fulfill in the lives of every person here and listening somewhere your purposes for why you told me to say these words. Jesus, please now send your Holy Spirit into each person and help them to receive it. Lord, help those who need to come up and have prayer and laying on of hands to do it. For those that you want to bring out unto yourself and just deal with alone, help them to follow up and surrender. But please, Jesus, Fulfill now the purpose for which you have spoken these words, and please now send the Holy Spirit into our lives. Amen.